Genesis chapter 4. We're thankful to be in the service again. Glad to see each one that's here. We appreciate you if you're visiting with us this morning. Thank you so much for coming to be with us in the service. Genesis chapter 4. We want to read just a couple of verses here. Verse 16 and verse 17. Genesis chapter 4. Verse 16 and verse 17. While you're turning, I, I, I think it's needful for the, me to mention a couple of things. Uh, this is almost a, a continuation of what we looked at Wednesday night. And uh, it's not it, that you had to have been here because I know maybe uh, some of you weren't here Wednesday night. But we looked at the idea that God is a spirit. And uh, we, we looked at the, the person of God, the Father, and who he is and uh, where he's at, that kind of thing, and uh, looking at the bodily presence of him, so to speak, and we come up with the idea of uh, of looking at the fact that God is, is everywhere, and he's in everything. And so we're going to kind of continue that a little bit and think about it maybe from a little bit different perspective here this morning. Verse 16, I know all of you are familiar with the situation that happened with Cain as Cain slew his brother, Abel and God came to Cain and began to tell him about uh, the the what's going to happen to him from here, and uh, God gave him his punishment, and uh, Cain made the statement, of course, that uh, it's too much for me. And in verse 16, this statement is made, and Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden, and Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. I'm going to stop reading there. And so we see that, that the, the first thing that Cain does after that God has given him this punishment and, and put this upon him is that he goes to uh, leave. He went out from the presence of the Lord. He got away from God, if you will. He, he ran from from God. He didn't want to be around God. He didn't want to be with God. He didn't want to be in the presence of God, but he left God. Now, again, you go back to the idea that we mentioned Wednesday night. You say, well, God is everywhere. Uh, just because of the fact that God is everywhere does not mean also that there is a specific location of God. Both things can exist at the same time. Uh, are any of you familiar with the idea of a conundrum? A conundrum is something that you must understand in order to be able to understand the Bible. A conundrum is when two things exist at the same time that are opposite of each other and seem as though they cannot exist together. Okay, That's what a conundrum is. It's when there's something more that exists than, than we understand. Two things that seem contradictory to each other. You look at the idea of God's will, God's sovereignty. That means that God is in control of everything. And if God is in control of everything, how can man have free will? And if man has free will... How can God still control everything? And yet both things exist, and we have to understand that. The problem with Calvinism is that they lean too much to the sovereignty of God. The problem of Arminianism is they lean too much to the will of man. Both things exist at the same time. And what that tells us is that God is so far above humanity that he can allow us to do whatever we want to and do completely make our own choice and decisions and we still can affect his sovereign will. That's amazing to me and it glorifies God at the same time. That's the idea of a conundrum. I'll give you another example. Uh, when you look at your life, if you're saved, before you were saved, you could not accomplish one righteous act. After you've trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you can do righteous things. The Bible says that before we trusted Christ, we were free from righteousness. That's Romans 6. After we've trusted Christ, we have the ability to accomplish righteousness now. So with that being in mind, let me ask you a question. Who lives your life, you or Jesus, now that you're saved? And you may say, I live my life. And yet all of the righteous acts that you've done, are you really going to take credit for what Jesus has done for you? And then you say, okay, well, Jesus lives my life for me. And I heard a man say it this way, I wouldn't blame that mess on him. And so it's a conundrum, which one is correct? 
Which one is right? Well, they both exist at the same time. I am still the natural man. I am still in the old man. And the old man exists. And yet the new man is present with me as well. And so both are exist at the same time. And so while God is everywhere, God is also in a specific location. You say, well, how can that happen? I don't know. But that's what the Bible says. And so we just believe it. Because it's one of those things that we cannot completely understand. So we accept it to be the truth. And it more than we can understand. So here, God is in a location. And it would seem as if by the, uh, if you go back and read the conversation that God has with Cain, that God is in some type of, of presence or maybe bodily form at least when he is talking to Cain and he tells Cain of his punishment and all of this. And so Cain and God are here, and then Cain goes out to leave the presence of God. Now, can Cain leave the presence of God? That's an obvious answer. No, he cannot. But the point is not that Cain can't leave the presence of God. The point is that Cain wanted to leave the presence of God. That's what we're to understand by it. That Cain had in his mind that he wanted to be away from God. And wherever it was that God was at, Cain didn't want to be there. Now this is the first, not the first time that we've encountered this in Scripture. If you back up one chapter in Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, you find the same thing again. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and God's, the, they, they heard the voice of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, they hid themselves from the presence of God. Now again, you see the same scenario. Them attempting to hide from what would seem as if a bodily presence of God, but but yet God knows all things and God is everywhere so God knew where they were at. So can, you know, can we hide from the presence of God? Obviously the answer to that is no. But the bigger problem is that why do you want to? Why do you not want to be where God's at? Why would you run from the presence of God? Why would you run from the presence of our very creator? I think there's some a reason for that. We're going to dig into that a little bit. If you look at, and you go on and continue to look at Jonah, in the book of Jonah, you don't have to turn there, but in Jonah chapter 1, the same statement is made about Jonah. That God told Jonah to go and preach the garden, uh, or excuse me, in, in, in Nineveh. And uh, as he goes into Nineveh, or rather, it, 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 that he's afraid to go to Nineveh, he, he, the, the Bible says that he just leaves. And, and, and he goes out to Tarshish, which would be modern-day Spain, from, I, I would assume, the nation of Israel. And he's, a, a, as he's going, he's going completely in the opposite of direction of what God had asked him to do. And the, the statement's made in verse 10 that he was trying to escape the presence of God. Why would he do that? Why would any man want to escape the presence of God? Have y'all ever found somebody that you just enjoy being with? You, you, you enjoy being in their presence. When you're, when you're with them, they, they, it's an enjoyable time. You, you, you feel good, you know. You, you have fun, you laugh, and you care. You know, whatever it is, you just enjoy being with them. It should be that way with God, right? It should be the case that people should enjoy being in the presence of God. And so what we've got here is we've actually got a situation where men are running from the presence of God. Where men are trying to get away from the presence of God. And yet, why is this the case? The reason it's the case is because God is holy. And we, we, can, we don't even understand what that means completely for God to be holy. He is so holy that in Isaiah chapter 6, the seraphim, as they're flying around the throne of God, are not saying you know, all the attributes of God that could have been mentioned as they're talking about God. They didn't say love. They didn't say righteousness. They didn't say peace or joy. They didn't say any of that. They said holy. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And so the Bible is denoting to us the holiness of God. Now, 
Now I want to mention to you something that I have found myself. Not because I'm, and don't misunderstand me, not because I'm anywhere near the Lord. But it just kind of comes with the office of being a preacher. There's certain people that they'd just rather not be around you because you're a preacher. There's a lot of people that I, I was friends with and I surrendered to preach. I ain't heard from them. You go around them and they're different. They don't act the same. Why? I ha have I changed? I'm the same man I was before I surrendered to preach. Maybe I've grown some. But what changed? The change is that they're now around somebody not who is holy, but who represents the idea of holiness. And the reason that people find themselves acting different around the pastor, the preacher, is because the pastor himself represents the idea of holiness, not necessarily that he is holy. And if they do that around the, 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 the preacher, then what about the Lord? You know, a, a lot of times today, you know, forgive me, this earpiece kind of getting down in my mouth a little bit. I may get too loud. But a lot of times today we hear the idea of Jesus and that Jesus is just love. And, you know, Jesus is all of this. And, and it's almost this kind, of the, this kind of idea that Jesus is just an everyday run-of-the-mill person. And I realize that Jesus is, is kind and he is love and he is easy to be around. And he is easy to be around when you're right with him. When you're right with him. But Jesus is holy. And if we're not right with him, you're going to find it very difficult to be in his presence. Why? Because men love darkness rather than light. Because their deeds are evil. And when that light begins to shed light upon our darkness, then we tend to want to run from the light. That's our nature. That's the nature of man. That's the nature of Cain. That was the nature of Adam. That was the nature of Jonah time and time again. Y'all remember Simon Peter? As Simon Peter first met the Lord, the scripture calls him, says he was naked. That doesn't mean he didn't have any clothes on at all. That means he was for the better part naked. He was working. He was hot. And he probably had taken some things off. He had taken his main coat on and all of, all of that that was off. And, and as he was introduced to the Lord Jesus Christ as being the Messiah, y'all remember what he said? He said, depart from me. Depart from me. He told the Lord, leave. Why? He said, for I am a sinful man. And the reason that there was an issue between he and the Lord was not because the Lord had done something. It was not because the Lord had shown up there or, or something. Other than that. It was for the fact that Peter was a sinful man and that, that, that the very presence of Jesus Christ pointed out his sinful condition. The very holiness of Christ showed Peter that he was wrong. He, he, he had made a mistake. He was a sinful man. He was out of fellowship with God. What I'm trying to help us understand is this sheds light on the fact that there is a separation between you and God. If you're here this morning and you find it difficult to be in the presence of God, if you find it difficult to be under the preaching of God's Word, do you find it difficult to be in church? You know why so many people struggle with being at church? It's because not because there's a bunch of uh, hypocrites in the building, although to probably to some degree or another we all are. But it's because the fact that being in the, in, in, in the church house reminds them of their sinful condition and it should, the, 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 the holiness that is represented here sheds light on the fact that they're sinners. And it points out the fact that they are not right with God. They're not right with God. So this morning, are you right with the Lord? Are you trying to run from God? Are you attempting to leave the presence of God? And if you're attempting to leave the presence of God, why would you do that? For those of us that are saved, I want you to think for a moment. This shed a little bit, hopefully, if you're here and lost, I want you to pay attention to this very closely. 
because there's no greater place to be than in the presence of God one of the things that I look most forward to about heaven is being in the presence of God all problems of my life are gone We always find our place and to some degree or another, no matter how close we get to the Lord here, there's a degree of discontentment that we're going to face. But when we find ourselves in the presence of Jesus Christ, we will be completely content. Because of our, our lack of contentment is not because we don't have things. Our lack of contentment is because we don't have Jesus. We're not with Him. And we long to be with Christ. You were designed today to have a relationship with God. And the very fact that you're running from God sheds light on the fact that your, your relationship with Him is separated. And why is that the case? Romans chapter 5 makes a statement that we have peace with God. There's some of us that have peace with God. There's some of us that, that have that relationship that's been restored and we enjoy being in the presence of God. Why? Not because we're any better than anybody else. But because Jesus has made it possible for that relationship to be restored. And that through Christ you can have eternal life. Through Christ, you can come into the presence of God and enjoy it through, through, through the Lord Jesus Christ. You can find that contentment and that peace and joy in being in the presence of God. I want you to turn with me to the book of Exodus real quick. 33, Exodus 33. While you're turning to Exodus 33, the, the position that we're coming to in the Bible is where the children of Israel have come to Mount Sinai. Moses has gone up on the mountain. He's gotten the tables of stone. He's come down, and he's found the children of Israel in idolatry. They're worshiping. When he comes down off the mountain, they're worshiping a golden calf, which to me is fascinating because he's up on the mountain, receive, mountain receiving the law of God that demands them to either keep this law or die and coming I mean he hadn't even got off the mountain and he finds them in shape that they're in idolatry and deserving of death and it sheds light on the whole fact of humanity and where we stand and so this is the position and, and God's leading these people for the sake of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob uh, he's leading them to the land of Canaan that he promised to give them and so in verse 1 of chapter 33 after this takes place and this is what the Lord tells Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart, and go up hence, thou and the people, which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying, Unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Hiviite, and the Jebusite. Basically, I'm going to stop there for a moment. What he's saying is you go up, I promised them, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that I was going to give them this land. And so you go up and you go into that land and you take these people with you into that land. And I'm going to send an angel before you. I'm going to send him and I'm going to drive these people out from before you. But verse 3, unto the land, unto land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in the midst. I will not go up in the midst of thee. For thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Here it is that they're, they're, they're in a position that this relationship between them and God is severed. It's broken. And God said, I'm not going to be with you anymore. I'm not going. And so you go up and I promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that land. I promised them they were going to have it. Their descendants were. And so y'all go up and y'all go take it. And I'm going to do what I promised you, but I'm not going with you. I'm not going to be with you. Because you're, you're sinful people, you're stiff-necked people. What the nation of Israel really does throughout the Old Testament is it just shows us the nature of mankind. So we're to find ourselves in the nation of Israel. That's, that's who we are. But I want you to notice Moses' attitude. Moses' attitude, he 
intercedes for the people. Verse 13, he says, Now therefore I pray, this is between the conversation between God and uh, Moses. He says, I, I pray, if this is Moses, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now the way that I may know thee, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, My presence shall go with thee, and I will give thee rest. Verse 15, And he said unto him, This is Moses speaking again, If thy presence go not with me, carry us not up hence. Now that's a powerful statement. Now that What Moses is saying there in my own kind of southern terms is if you ain't going, we ain't going either. If you ain't going, don't carry us up either because we don't want to go. If you ain't going to go with us, we don't want to go. Why? Because we want to be with you. We want to be with you. Now let me ask you this. Do you find that to be the case in your life? That as you're looking around and you, you're, you're going through life and you're making the decisions and, and doing things in life that you say, Lord, do I need to do this? Are you in me, in me doing this? Are you going to be with me if I do this thing or if I go this way or if I get into this place or go to this direction? Because if you're not with me, then I don't want to go. You get to this place as being, you know, and, 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 and looking at it from kind of my experience and my point of view, you know, there's a lot of different politics and things. You get into trying to pastor a church, and you say, well, you go pastor this place, or you go pastor this one's the big one. Why would you tell this church, no, it's the big church to pastor, you know? Because if I go up and God's not with me, then what have I done? If I go up, the question is, God, are you going to be with me? Because if you're not going, I'm not going either. Where do you want me to be? And that's not just the way of the pastor. It should be the way of all of us. Why? Because we need the presence of God. We need to be in the presence of God. And so there you've got this, this, this I wanted to try to show you this uh, contradiction between two people, if you will. You've got Cain who is too, doing his best to get away from God. And you've got Moses who said, I ain't going nowhere unless you go with me. What had Moses found in the presence of God? Moses had found something in the presence of God that he did not want to leave. Today, if you're lost, you're denying yourself a relationship with the creator of heaven and the creator of earth, the creator of everything that we see in this world. The one that you are designed to have a relationship and everything that you feel like you're missing in life and, and that, that void that's in, in here is because you're not connected to God. And that relationship is severed. And the fact that you're running from God bears witness of that. It shows you that the reason that you're running from God is because you're allowing your nature to guide you. And that is your very nature to try to get away from the holiness of God. But today we have peace with God, those of us that are saved. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there again, the reason man run is because of the holiness of God, because of our sinful condition. I want you to turn with me to, I want to read just a couple of verses over in the book of Hebrews and maybe one in the book of Jude, if you'll turn over there with me. Hebrews chapter 9, really quick. I, I, I want to, I'll probably end up tying it back to the book of Ephesians in chapter 1, 2. You don't have to turn there, but you can make a note of that. In Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 2. The Hebrews chapter 10. While you're turning, one of the keys to understanding the New Testament is the phrase in Christ or in Jesus Christ or in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see this over and over again that we are in Christ. Those of us that are saved are in Christ. Those of us that are saved are the bride. What does that mean? The Being the bride is, is literally we are saved by being married to Jesus Christ. 
That's what the Bible teaches, that we are literally saved because we are married to him. And so the reason that the devil can't touch us and the reason the righteousness of Christ is imputed upon him, the reason our sins are paid for in the sacrificial offering of Jesus Christ is because we are one flesh through the covenant of marriage. Why is that important? Because notice what he's saying. Verse 24, Hebrews 9, verse 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands. Christ is not entered into this temple on earth. Christ is not entered into this tabernacle on earth where the presence of God was represented between the Jerusalem on the mercy seat where the blood was sprinkled of the sacrifices. But Christ has entered into the holy places in heaven. He's entered into the very presence of God. And every one of us that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ have entered into the presence of God by Jesus. And Ephesians chapter 1 says we've been made to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what he's talking about. We've been made to sit in the very presence of God because of Jesus Christ. There's nothing to me there's nothing to any of us. We're all sinners. And none of us can enter into the presence of God of our own volition. And there was a time in my own life that I ran from the presence of God and I didn't even realize what I was running from. I was running from the greatest blessing. Running from the greatest blessing that my life has ever known. Today I have a representative. I am in heaven through Jesus Christ. Seated at the right hand of God. That's what, that's what the writer means. Ephesians, that Paul means Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 10 or chapter 10. Now go on down here. And in, in verse 21 he says, And having an high priest... Chapter 10, verse 21. And having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance. How can I do that? In full assurance. What he's telling us is I can go into the presence of God in full assurance with a true heart, full understanding that it's not by me that got me in here. It's only by the blood of Jesus Christ, that perfect Lamb of God that offered Himself for my sin. And through Him, my relationship with God has been restored. And through Him, I can enter into the very presence of God. I want you to turn with me to one other scripture. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 17, therefore, if any man, now here it is, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ. Now, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Why? Because he is in the body of Christ. And through Jesus Christ, we were dead on the cross at Calvary. Through Jesus Christ, we have been raised. That's what baptism symbolizes to walk in the newness of life. And so he says, that therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are come new. All, in verse 18, and all things are of God who hath, notice this word, reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. What does that mean? It means those of us that are saved have been reconciled unto God by Jesus Christ. The word reconciled means that this relationship has been restored. Why is that important? He says, and hath given uh, to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in the world, or, or excuse me, to God, and to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The reason that God's showing you in your heart this morning 
that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus Christ is because he's attempting to reconcile you to himself. He's attempting to restore that relationship between you and him that you could have peace with him and can only be done through the Lord Jesus Christ. And without Christ, there is no reconciliation. Without Christ, there is no way to enter into the presence of God. Now, verse 19, notice the ending. He says this, uh, verse, he says, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto thee. Why would he not impute our trespasses unto us? Now, that, that there will preach about uh, the, the uh, e eternal security of the believer. That our sins are not reconciled unto, or, or rather not imputed unto us because Christ has already paid the debt for them. In this last part, verse 19, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Today you look at a pastor and say, what is a, what is a pastor to do? Well, what's his job? You know, can, can a pastor save somebody? If a pastor tells you that, that you're saved, then you don't need to listen to him. Because I don't have the ability to tell you that I am not qualified to tell you whether or not you're saved. Only you and the Lord know that. And you know whether you're right between you and God. He'll show you that. What he's done for me as a preacher is committed unto me the word of reconciliation. In other words, that it's my place to tell you that you can be reconciled with God, but only through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that because he reconciled me. He saved me. And so no matter how good, no matter how bad, no matter what your life is being, you're a sinner because no man is perfect but Jesus Christ. And because of our sinful condition, we need Jesus. He's committed unto us this word, those of us that are saved, this word of reconciliation. Verse 20, now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. We pray you be reconciled to God. Verse 21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The day we can be saved. We, you don't have to run anymore from the presence of God. You don't have to fear the presence of God you can trust the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved and you can be able through Jesus Christ to enter into the heavenly places in him and you can look forward to that day that we will one day be in the very presence of God and that we will all dwell together on this earth today there's nothing to run from and the reason that you're running is because God is holy and it's showing you your need. Today, if God is drawing you, he's showing you he wants to be reconciled to you. But that only through the person of Jesus Christ. And this morning, if you'll trust Jesus Christ, you can be saved while we have a verse of a song.